All right, let's talk about something that might completely blow your mind, red dwarf stars. You've probably heard of them, maybe even seen some headlines about their solar flares, but I bet you didn't realize just how dangerous these flares really are, not just for the planets around them, but for the entire idea of life outside of Earth. I mean, we've all been fascinated by the idea of finding Earth-like planets in other solar systems, right? It's a dream that keeps scientists up at night. But what if I told you that we might have been looking in the wrong places, or even worse, that some of the planets we were most excited about might not be habitable at all? That's where red dwarf flares come in. Let's take a step back for a second. Most of us are familiar with our sun's solar flares. They're intense, sure, but we've been lucky. Our sun is pretty chill compared to some of the other stars out there. Every once in a while, it throws off a flare that disrupts satellites or gives us an amazing light show, you know, the Aurora Borealis. But it's nothing compared to what happens around red dwarfs. These stars are like the hyperactive kids of the universe. They're smaller and cooler than our sun, but man, when they get going, they can unleash flares that make anything we've seen look like a sparkler on the 4th of July. Click subscribe to this channel to get more topics you love. Here's where it gets wild for years. Scientists thought red dwarfs were good candidates for finding habitable planets. They burn at a lower temperature, which means they last way longer, like billions of years longer than our sun. That's a huge deal because it gives life plenty of time to develop. But nature doesn't give anything away for free, right? Red dwarfs come with a massive catch. Their solar flares are off the charts intense, and they happen all the time. We're talking flares that are hundreds of times more powerful than the biggest flares our sun has ever produced. And here's where things get really scary. These flares could completely strip away a planet's atmosphere, leaving it exposed to deadly radiation. Imagine a world that could have had oceans, an atmosphere, maybe even the right ingredients for life, just getting fried over and over again until it's nothing but a barren rock. So what does that mean for the planets we found around red dwarfs? You've probably heard of planets like Proxima Centauri b, which orbits the closest star to us, a red dwarf. For a while, people were hyped about it. It's in the so-called habitable zone where liquid water might exist. But here's the thing nobody wants to hear the star it orbits shoots off flares that could sterilize the surface every few months. Imagine living on a planet where every few weeks you get hit with radiation so intense it could destroy your DNA. That's the kind of nightmare scenario we're talking about. Now, I know what you're thinking, but wait, can't the planet's atmosphere protect it? The short answer? Not really. These flares are so powerful, they could strip away the atmosphere itself. And if that happens, there's no protection left. No atmosphere means no water, no air, no life. Deep question to consider if the universe is filled with red dwarfs, since they're the most common stars, what does that mean for the potential of life out there? Have we been too optimistic about finding habitable planets? Now, let's dig even deeper into this. Think about what we've been doing for the last decade or so. We've been scouring the skies, looking for Earth-like planets. And guess where we found a lot of them? Around red dwarfs. That's because these stars are small and dim, which makes it easier to spot planets passing in front of them. And when we spot a planet in the so-called habitable zone around a red dwarf, we get excited. Why wouldn't we? If it's in that zone, there's a chance it could have liquid water. And where there's water, there could be life. But, and this is a huge but, we've been underestimating the sheer chaos happening around these stars. 
It's like we've been eyeing the nicest looking house on the block, only to realize it's sitting right next to an erupting volcano. You wouldn't want to live there, right? Well, that's kind of what's going on with these red dwarf systems. Here's another crazy thing these flares don't just happen once in a while. Red dwarfs can spit out flares multiple times a day. That's like living in a place where the weather forecast says there's a 90% chance of deadly radiation today and tomorrow and the day after that. And because these planets are usually closer to their stars than Earth is to the sun, they get hit even harder. It's like standing right next to a firework when it goes off. Now, we know that life on Earth developed under some pretty harsh conditions. Our planet's been through ice ages, asteroid impacts, and more. But even Earth hasn't had to deal with the kind of constant, planet-sterilizing radiation that these planets are facing. And here's where it gets even more depressing. Even if a planet around a red dwarf managed to hold onto its atmosphere for a while, those flares could still wreak havoc on the chemistry of the air and water. You need a delicate balance of elements to create and sustain life, and these flares could mess with all of that, destroying ozone layers, breaking apart water molecules, and generally making the planet as hostile as possible. So, what can we do with this information? Does it mean we should stop looking for life around red dwarfs altogether? Not necessarily. But it does mean that we need to adjust our expectations. We've been so focused on finding Earth-like planets that we might have missed the bigger picture. Maybe the planets we're most excited about aren't as promising as we thought. Maybe we need to start thinking outside the box, looking for life in places we haven't even considered yet. Maybe the stars we've been overlooking, the ones that seem less likely to host life, are actually the ones we should be paying attention to. Another deep question if we find life, or signs of life, around a red dwarf, what kind of life would it even be? Could something survive in conditions that extreme? All right, so we've established that red dwarfs are way more dangerous than we thought. But where do we go from here? How does this change the way we approach the search for life beyond Earth? For one, we need to rethink what we mean by habitability. Up until now, we've been using pretty simple criteria. Is the planet in the habitable zone? Does it have the right conditions for liquid water? Could it have an atmosphere? but we're realizing that it's a lot more complicated than that. Just being in the right spot isn't enough if the star is constantly bombarding the planet with deadly radiation. This is where technology comes into play. We've got tools now, like the James Webb Space Telescope, that are helping us look at planets in new ways. We can study their atmospheres, check for signs of chemical reactions that could hint at life, and even look for biosignatures in the light coming from these planets. But here's the thing, even with all this amazing technology, we're still limited by our assumptions. If we keep expecting to find planets that are just like Earth, orbiting stars that are just like our Sun, we might miss out on some really important discoveries. What if life can exist in places we can't even imagine yet? What if there are forms of life that can survive the constant onslaught of radiation from red dwarfs? We don't know, but that's exactly why we need to keep looking. The universe is massive, bigger than we can even comprehend. And if there's one thing we've learned from studying space, it's that nature is full of surprises. So, where does that leave us? Should we give up on the idea of finding life around red dwarfs? Absolutely not. But we need to be realistic. These flares are a huge problem, and they're not going away. If we want to understand the potential for life in the universe, we need to study these flares, figure out just how destructive they are, and look for planets that might be protected from them in some way. 
Maybe they have strong magnetic fields that can shield them from the worst of the radiation. Or maybe there are other factors we haven't even thought of yet that could make life possible. And who knows? Maybe one day we'll find a planet out there that has somehow managed to survive the chaos of a red dwarf solar flares. A planet that's been through hell and back, but still has life clinging to it. Wouldn't that be something? Final deep question if life can survive in those extreme conditions, what does that say about the resilience of life itself? Could life be more common and more adaptable than we ever imagined? So, we've talked about how red dwarf flares are a massive problem for habitability. But now, let's flip that around and ask a different question. One that might change how we think about life in the universe. What if life could actually evolve to survive in those extreme environments? Think about it. Life on Earth has shown an incredible ability to adapt to hostile conditions. We found microorganisms living in the deep ocean near hydrothermal vents, thriving in total darkness under crushing pressure. We found bacteria in acidic hot springs, surviving in water that would dissolve most other life forms. There are even tiny creatures called tardigrades that can withstand the vacuum of space and exposure to high levels of radiation. If life on Earth can survive in these extreme environments, why couldn't life on a planet orbiting a red dwarf evolve to handle the constant bombardment of solar flares? I know what you're thinking, but radiation is deadly. How could anything survive that? And you're right, radiation is dangerous. It can damage DNA, destroy cells, and kill living organisms. But here's the thing, life has already evolved ways to protect itself from radiation. Some bacteria produce special proteins that repair damaged DNA. Some organisms can go into a state of suspended animation when exposed to radiation, essentially shutting down until conditions improve. And some have evolved thick protective shells or pigments that shield them from harmful rays. It's possible that life on a planet orbiting a red dwarf could evolve similar defenses, maybe even ones we can't imagine yet. Let's take it a step further. What if life on these planets didn't just evolve to survive the flares, but to thrive on them? Maybe the energy from the flares could actually be a source of fuel for certain types of life. On Earth, plants use sunlight to produce energy through photosynthesis. What if, on a planet orbiting a red dwarf, organisms evolved to use the intense radiation from solar flares in a similar way? It sounds crazy, but we've already seen life make use of extreme energy sources here on Earth. This idea opens up a whole new way of thinking about life in the universe. We tend to think of habitability in terms of Earth-like conditions, moderate temperatures, liquid water, a stable atmosphere. But what if life doesn't need those things? What if it can evolve in ways we haven't even considered, adapting to environments that seem completely inhospitable? Suddenly, the universe seems a lot more full of possibilities. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Even if life could evolve to survive red dwarf flares, it would still face enormous challenges. The flares wouldn't just be an occasional inconvenience, they'd be a constant, life-threatening danger. The evolution needed to survive in that kind of environment would have to be extreme. And even if life could adapt, it might look nothing like the life we're familiar with. It might be microbial, living underground or in deep oceans, where it's shielded from the worst of the radiation. It might be so different from life on Earth that we wouldn't even recognize it if we saw it. Another deep question if life can adapt to conditions as extreme as red dwarf flares. What does that say about the potential for life elsewhere in the universe? Could life be more resilient and more diverse 
than we ever imagined. Now that we've considered the possibility that life could evolve to survive in these extreme environments, let's think about what this means for the future of our search for extraterrestrial life. Are we ready to broaden our definition of what life means? Are we ready to look in places we once thought were too hostile for even the simplest organisms? We're at a crossroads in space exploration. On one hand, we've made incredible progress in finding planets outside our solar system. We've identified thousands of exoplanets, some of which are in the habitable zone of their stars. But on the other hand, we're starting to realize that being in the habitable zone doesn't guarantee that a planet is actually habitable. Red dwarf flares are a perfect example of this. A planet could be in the right spot for liquid water, but if it's getting blasted by radiation every few days, it might not matter. So, where do we go from here? First, we need to keep studying these planets in more detail. Telescopes like the James Webb Space Telescope are giving us new insights into the atmospheres of distant planets, and that's going to be crucial for understanding whether these worlds could support life. We need to look for signs that a planet has an atmosphere, and not just any atmosphere, but one that's thick enough and stable enough to protect the surface from radiation. We also need to look for biosignatures, chemical signs of life, like the presence of oxygen or methane, that could tell us if life is there, even if we can't see it directly. But we also need to be open to the idea that life might exist in forms we're not used to. We've spent so much time looking for Earth-like planets that we might have missed opportunities to find life in places we wouldn't expect. Uh, maybe instead of looking for planets that are just like Earth, we should be looking for planets that are nothing like Earth. Planets that have evolved to survive in extreme conditions, like those around red dwarfs. And here's where things get really exciting. The universe is huge. There are billions of stars in our galaxy alone, and most of them are red dwarfs. If even a small fraction of those stars have planets, and even a smaller fraction of those planets could support life, that still means there could be millions of potentially habitable worlds out there. We've barely scratched the surface of what's possible. But we need to be patient. The search for life beyond Earth is going to take time and it's going to require us to rethink some of our assumptions. We might not find life where we expect to find it. We might not even recognize it when we see it. But that's what makes this search so exciting. It's not just about finding another Earth. It's about discovering what life can be in all its forms. Final deep question. As we continue to explore the universe, are we prepared to accept that life might exist in ways we've never imagined? And if so, how will that change our understanding of our place in the cosmos? Okay, let's bring this all back home. What do red dwarf flares and the search for extraterrestrial life teach us about life here on Earth. A lot, actually. <laughs>